I wonder where your heart is as we meet in this place. I wonder how many of us in this room have the guts to come completely honestly before the Lord Jesus. Because that's the only way that the word lands is it is the spirit of truth. We come to him, whatever our circumstances, whatever state that we're in, but we come to him gut level honest so he can get down to the real life quick of what we're going through. And, and I wonder if you would do something for me all over the room. I wonder if you have a smartphone, would you get it out? I wanna ask you a couple of questions and you answer as honestly as you know how. Are you ready? Number one, you would say, I consistently have a happy heart. Could I see your lights in the air? So thankful for you. So thankful for you. And you know what? We don't want anybody to be mad at you that came with you. It's <laughs> particularly if they're going like, I had no idea. If they're looking at you with a lot of shock, that's another area <laughs> that we really need to work through. But that, that's a beautiful thing. How many of you in this room would say, I could stand to have a happier heart? Okay, that, now, now we're talking. Now we're talking. Now I want somebody to be really gutsy here because let me tell you something I've learned about Jesus. When somebody's already holding hers up. She goes, I know where this is going. I know where this is going. I, I'm gonna tell you something I know about him. When we're desperate for him, he's coming for us. It's just, it's just his way. When we need him, that's part of what the Beatitudes are all about. Blessed is this one, blessed is that one. And we're looking at all these things and why would they be blessed? Because blessed are you if you need me because I'm gonna be there for you. I, I'm gonna come through. But here's the third one. What on the earth is a happy heart? Anybody? Uh-huh. Now we're talking. Now we're talking. Now I have an agree or disagree question for you. I'm going to make a statement rather, and then I want you to just either you agree with it or disagree, and I'll ask for all the agrees to hold their light up, and then I'll ask for all the disagrees. The body of Christ has a reputation for being a happy people. If you agree with that, may I please see your lights? Mm-hmm. Yes. If you disagree with that, may I please see your lights? Uh-huh. So let me tell you what's gonna be worrisome right now. If somebody is already sad because we're going to study happy, that's how you know, <laughs> that's how you know you are in exactly the place that you need to be sitting. And I'm gonna tell you what started this with me. I, last week was um, just, you know, I'm social. I love social media. I, I like to watch conversations. I like to keep up with what's going on. I like to know the climate, um, or the social climate, sociology, and, and um, people uh, kinds of issues uh, in our part of the world and on the globe. But I'm particularly interested in what has impact over the church, that's, that's my whole life. And many, many others in this room would say the same thing. That's what, that's what we're called to. So I have great interest in this. And, and I just, I sat back and said out loud, uh, we are just getting more and more miserable. And maybe that doesn't startle you, but it startled me. Because I gotta tell you something. I have not been a miserable person. I, I, just misery is not one of those things. But I just can't tell you that I've ever felt at risk of catching a climate of church misery until just here recently. And you know how you have a revelation all of a sudden that you think, uh-uh. I'm, I'm not doing that. I'm not gonna get miserable with you people. 
Anybody? Can, I need to hear somebody. Anybody? And, and you know what? I want you to be able to say that to me, people. I want you to be, listen, Beth, I'm not going to get miserable with you. Because we've had so much divisiveness. And you know, here's the thing. I don't think anybody's happy. In any, I, I think the church is in such, and I say that, let me back that up. I'm generally speaking here, but I'm saying I don't know if any pockets that I would just tell you are thriving in their joy right now. I, I just don't see it. I don't see it. I just see so much fighting, so much division, and so, so much meanness. I, listen, I'm not talking about the world. I'm talking about us. We're getting meaner than snakes. I, we're supposed to be sheep among wolves, and we've become wolves among sheep. And at some point, we gotta raise up our hand and go, uh-uh, no, I, you know what, I'm not, I'm not doing this. I'm not doing this. I'm not taking part in this. You and I are gonna study the theology of happiness, taking happy back. And I hope that you will see, and I'm ready, I'm ready. In other words, I've come prepared for someone I love so much and am so thankful to serve that is already going, it is not biblical to be happy. I'm, already, I'm ready for her because some of you may not be given to that, but honestly, many of us were raised in a part of the body of Christ where it, listen, to be happy would have meant you are in some kind of sin, and if you're happy and you know it, repent. <laughs> There'd be no clap in your hands. <laughs> repent. So is that sound theology or not? We're gonna study that through. Here's where we're gonna launch. I want you to get two different portions of the scripture in your hand right now. Go to Isaiah 52, and then I want you to Luke 2. And so I wanna look at them back and forth. We're gonna look at Isaiah 52, then Luke 2, then back to Isaiah 52 to make the point. So I want you to look at these two places. Isaiah 52 verse seven says this, how beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news, who publishes peace, who brings good news of happiness, who publishes salvation, who says to Zion, your God reigns. I want you to turn with me now to Luke. Don't let go of Isaiah 52 because I'm coming right back to it. Luke chapter two, eight through 11. And in the same region, there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. Verse 10, and the angel said to them, fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Would you go back with me one more time to Isaiah 52, 7? Let's let it land. It says this, how beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news, who publishes peace, who brings good news of happiness. Let's just put it really bluntly. Happy is not bad in the Bible. I gotta tell you something. One of our expectations in a verse like that, when I threw out that wording in the ASV, Isaiah 52, seven, good news of happiness. You and I would not have looked up so quickly had it said good news of holiness. We'd have been ready for that. And, and it seems to us that's, that's what it ought to say because that we're comfortable with. Good news of happiness, what does that mean? Because we so seldom will throw that word into a sound presentation of the scriptures unless somehow we're gonna try to refute it as even being on the list of things we wanna think about pursuing in Christ. I wanna challenge that based on his word. But what we're gonna find out as we study together, because holiness is huge. We have been set apart in him. You be holy, the word of God says in 1 Peter 1, because he is holy. There is a happiness to holiness and there's a holiness to happiness when it is in Christ. Let me tell you, if, if we equate licentiousness with happiness, we have got a skewed view of holiness. Honestly, if we don't think in our minds that we could be set apart and holy 
at the same time that we could have a happy heart, we, we want to have a, a stronghold of legalism broken off of us because that is not sound theology, and I hope to prove it to you. I want you to hear, I'm going to quote out of uh, Happiness by Randy Alcorn. I want you to hear this portion of it. He says this, quoting straight out word for word. I looked up all references to these words in the ESV. Happiness, joy, enjoy, rejoice, gladness, merry, pleasure, delight, celebration, cheerful, please, pleasant, laugh, laughter, smile, jubilant, relax, rest, feast, festival, and exult. These and their related words appear more than 1,700 times. When we add the times the word blessed is used to translate words that mean happy, the total comes to about 2,000. Do you realize that we have set parts of our entire systematic theologies on, ver on five or less verses? Built whole entire doctrines around a couple of verses. I'm not even challenging that. I'm just saying by the time you have a concept that is mentioned 1,700 times in the scripture, we might want to look up and give it some thought. Because I'm telling you what I'm throwing out is that right now we could use a message on the happy heart. Anybody? Because what I'm here to tell you is that I think from where I'm sitting and from where a whole lot of other people are sitting, it looks like the church is getting nothing but unhappier day by day, week by week, and fight by fight. I'm going to tell you this, life gives us ample grounds, every single one of us, to be unhappy. Every one of us. So we've earned the right, if we want to be unhappy people, we've earned the right so we can go right ahead. So if we want to give way to that or not, and that's the way we want to live. Because naturally speaking, we've all had things that have happened. But what we'd be shocked to know if we don't already know it is that people who are happy and have a happy heart have not had all happy circumstances. It will be very rare that you find someone that you can just say, you know what, you just, you really honestly, you seem to be a happy person. That they're going to return back to you in earnest if you've got time for a real conversation. You know what, I, I just, I've never had anything bad happen. <laughs> I mean, it, just, it just doesn't happen. That, that's not the way it goes. Are there seasons and times that are extremely sad and tragic when grief is uh, not only appropriate, but needful? That we wouldn't have a healthy heart if we didn't work through it. But you have the biblical right and responsibility to fight for a happy heart in Christ. I'm serious about being happy in Jesus. Anybody else? I mean, I, I, I'm serious that I'm not letting anyone take that from me. I'm not, that is something I have had as a gift in my heart for most of my life, and I am not letting it go. Now, listen carefully, because I want to throw something at you that I think can be an issue in our churches when we want to have, you know, when we want to be conservative about the Scriptures, and I do. I do. Um, what can happen to us sometimes is that in our appropriate resistance, listen carefully, appropriate resistance to what 2 Timothy 4 verse 3 says, there will come a time when people will not tolerate sound teaching. Instead, following their own desires, they will accumulate teachers for themselves because they have an insatiable curiosity to hear new things. And they will turn away from hearing the truth, but instead they will turn to myths. And so we are so, so vigilant to make sure that's not happening that sometimes we'll shut down a word before we even know it's sound because here's what we think. This is what we are risking when we want to be really, really, really tight, and we do in the way we're interpreting the Scriptures. Because what can happen is that we can get in the mindset, we can twist that until what it means to us is that if it sounds like good news, it could not possibly be scriptural. And do you realize how absurd that sounds? Because the gospel, the word gospel means good news. 
And so in our hypervigilance to guard carefully our sound doctrine, and I want that. I want you to hold me to that. I want to hold you to that. I want my pastor to be held to that. I, I want our leaders to be held to that. I want that. But let's be careful that we don't immediately assume that it's got to be our itching ears that want to hear something that happens to be good. That if everything we thought we were getting until we get to heaven is just find a way to suffer well, if that's it, and, and we, we have to find a way to suffer well. But I mean, is that it? Is that all there is to it? Because we can get where we think, you know, because I liked it, it cannot be sound. It cannot be sound. I object and I'm closing down. But what if we went to the scriptures, checked it out to see, is it so or not? Okay, tell me what number one was, because number one was really, really, really important. Number one, glance back at it, is what? Happy is not bad in the Bible. If somebody just gets that tonight, that can be a great start. Number two, we've got a gospel responsibility to rebel against our misery. Good news falls on deaf ears coming from miserable people. We, I've said it so many times that it's just like, it's nothing new, but it, just, it means nothing to share the good news in a bad mood. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. Nobody wants it. Nobody wants it. Here lately, I've just had to look in the mirror at home and go, does, does someone want what you have? Because that's imperative. Because we'll just be meaner than snakes or we're just joyless. And then we're going to share the gospel with somebody. Let me tell you the secret that I found to my happy life. And they're going like. <laughs> our, our, our witness is at stake. And I, I want to push a step further than that. I, I, I've read this and reread this in my notes, and I think this is sound. For us to teach the world and the church to associate Christianity with misery is its own brand of heresy. I believe it. That when we teach the world and we teach one another through the church to associate Christianity with misery, it's its own brand of heresy. I truly believe that it is. I believe it counts. Would you go with me to Romans 12, 1 and 2, and let me show you something. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Verse 2. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind that by testing, you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. Look at the state of our world. Can you imagine how much light we could carry as this part of the world gets more and more miserable for us not to be conformed to them? And that's what's happening. We're catching it from them. Instead of them catching our joy, we're catching their misery. And it literally is invading through the body of Christ and through the doors of the church. And we want to hold our hands up and say, I'm not going to be any part of that. There is nothing about our calling that remotely suggests in this part of the free world that we're to blend in. Even in parts of the world where we can't own up openly and in the marketplace to our faith, something about us is meant to so shine, has such a brilliance to it, that it draws the attention of those around us to wonder what is the hope that is in us. Our lens is the gospel. We look at the world through the lens of the gospel, not at the gospel through the lens of the world. Happiness is not cluelessness. I'm gonna tell you this, I wanna just be straight out with this. I am not one whit encouraged by aphorisms that come from people who have their heads in the sand. 
That means nothing to me, nothing. So when, when I hear people, when they're, we're all posting our great sayings, but it's people that don't even know what's going on. I, it doesn't mean anything to me. Maybe it should, I'm just saying it doesn't. What means something to me is, is when somebody that is awake and aware of the turmoil that our world is in. This is when I start listening. When somebody then starts speaking faith and hope and love and light and forgiveness and turning the other cheek, when we start talking this in our day-to-day -day relationships, when I start seeing this of somebody who's aware, then all of a sudden, this changes everything. And I'm listening, because this is not somebody just doing the like head in the sand thing. It's somebody that's watching and still says, despite what is going on around us, this is the good news of our Lord Jesus Christ. Good news of happiness. Did you know that right here in Romans, you're right by it, turn to Romans 10. I mean, you're right next to it, just flip back a page. Romans 10, and I wanna read you verses 14 through 17. Remember back in Isaiah 52, seven, when it said that uh, we, that beautiful are the feet of those that bring good news of what? Somebody tell me, tell me again. Good news of happiness. Listen what happens right here, Romans 10, 14 through 17. How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they've never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written here, he's gonna quote it out of Isaiah 52, this portion of it. How beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. But they have not all obeyed the gospel, but Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed what he has heard from us? So faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. So beautiful and powerful. The point is that in Romans, the apostle Paul, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, now says, remember that verse back in Isaiah 52, seven? Of course, ultimately it is Jesus Christ, the complete um, consummation of that coming of the good news in the flesh to give his life and to be resurrected from the dead. Um, and that every bit of that, every bit of that is applied to every believer who receives it. But right here in Romans chapter 10, the apostle Paul is saying, it's now our job. And we're the bearers of the good news. We're the bearers of it. And we remember from Isaiah 52, seven, it's good news of happiness. Here's the thing, it is undeniably innate in the human being to yearn to be happy. Is it everything to us? No, no. But I am saying that when we figure out that our heart is getting more and more miserable, there comes a time to go, you know what? I have the biblical right and responsibility to fight for a happy heart. I really, really do. I really, really do. Because it's, it's fruitless that somehow we're gonna get through to the world that there is absolutely no merit whatsoever and wondering what is it that would bring my heart some joy? I, I've, got, I've got to tell you something. Um, Jesus has made me happy. I mean, he just like makes me happy. And that gets to show in us. That gets to show because we really do have something that people are yearning for. We really do, unless the world has so rubbed off on us or so many divisive brothers and sisters have made us all so miserable, we no longer are in touch with it. If you and I do not find, at least in a default fashion, in between heartbreaks, some kind of happiness in Jesus Christ. We are gonna migrate in the faith, if we're in the faith, we're gonna migrate one of two directions. We're either gonna become carnal or we are gonna become curmudgeons. <laughs> Which one do you want to be? Because neither one is a good option. So this is the Christian. If the Christian in Christ does not know anything of a happy heart in Jesus. 
What's going to happen? If that's off limits to us, are we just like, have never even known to seek it in him? What's going to happen is that we are either going to migrate toward becoming carnal or we are going to migrate toward becoming curmudgeons. Don't think I'm not going to have you a Webster's definition of a curmudgeon in just a moment. <laughs> Anybody tired of the curmudgeons taking all the press lately? Anybody know what I'm talking about? Am I, am I missing anything or is it, is it it's just like, I tell you, I wish some happier people every now and then were representing the faith. Anybody, would it just be terrible? Would it just be terrible in our workplace for someone to like us? Would it? Would it just be terrible? Must we be the most miserable people in the place? I don't think so. I just don't think that's the way it's meant to be. So here's one. If you want to jot that down, do with the diagram. But here's the, thinking of that draw to carnality, Thomas Aquinas, and this is 12. 1225 to 1274, he said this, and I'm quoting, no one can live without delight. And that is why a man deprived of spiritual joy goes over to carnal pleasures. Now, I don't know if you believe that or not, because this is the thing. See, we're either going to migrate toward carnality or toward a curmudgeon. But I believe that to my bones. I believe it to my bones. I believe that in his presence, there are pleasures forevermore. I believe that there is a joy in Christ that this world cannot touch. In the midst of sorrows, in the midst of my disappointments, in the midst of my broken heart, and in the midst of yours, that there is something we have access to that this world cannot touch. But if we don't access ourselves to it, then we are drawn to carnal pleasures. Do you even know? Do, do I know? How long did it take for me to figure it out that Jesus Christ is meant to be the greatest pleasure of our lives? Of our lives. Now, I want to show you the definition of curmudgeon because there's a part of it I just, I'm just dying for you to see. You're, you're going to pretty well know what it means. A curmudgeon, there's two definitions for it. Crusty, ill-tempered, and I'm sorry, gentlemen, but usually an old man. I, I didn't come. I, am I Merriam-Webster? No. No. Um, archaic. What is that word right there? Miser. You see it? Miser. I, I looked that up because I, when I stared at that word, I thought, whoa, 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 whoa. I love word origins, and I'm, give me the word miser, and I'm going to see that word miserable. And I thought, I, I wonder if there's any connection between the word miser and miserable, and sure enough, as you would imagine, there is. I looked up miser in, in really its original um, meaning back in the 1540s, miserable person, a wretch, unhappy, pitiable, in distress, and it says original sense now obsolete. You know that huge differentiation, I'm talking about the huge one, not, not the small one, huge differentiation that is made um, in spiritual or religious circles between joy and happiness. You know, I mean, we've all heard it. Like, no, happiness is not, that's off the table. Joy. Joy is much, much better than happiness. And that there's this huge, huge difference between the two. We're not getting that from the Bible. I, I'm, listen, I want you to go study it and then see if it's so. Because we are making distinctions between joy and happiness that often extend further than the Scripture is taking those two words. I'll show it to you right here. The, the primary um, basic Greek word, the lexical for you Greek nerds, the lexical word that most often is translated into joy in the scriptures, that word is kara. It's, it's a word that is associated with charis, which is grace. For instance, in John 15, 11, I think it is when he says that um, my joy would be in you. This is Jesus talking to his disciples. That my joy would be in you and your joy would be complete. In English, we make the distinction between the two, between happy and joy, because in our English, and this is correct, in our English, that word happy, that H-A-P is the same word from which we get the word happens or happening. It's something, it's hap 
um, hazard. It's something that just happens, a circumstance. And so we say happiness is always circumstantial. It always is about what has happened. And joy is something that can be more pervasive in our everyday lives. That's a beautiful thing and has some merit in English. But here's what I want to throw back at you. Even if we settle with that and we go, okay, I, I cannot get past that. That's what I'm going to believe to the death. Then I want to ask you this question. Then has Jesus not changed our circumstances? If, it's, if, if happiness is only associated with circumstantial, have our circumstances not been changed? Because I just want, I just made a little list, a little list. We've been made citizens of heaven. Our sins have been removed as far as the east is from west. Uh, we're seated in the heavenlies. We're sealed by the Holy Spirit. We're no longer walking in darkness. We're no longer living in futility. And none of our suffering ever has to be in vain. I would say he's changed some of our circumstances. Anybody? My name is written in the book of life and, and so is yours. Uh, that's pretty big. So, I mean, I'm all about, am I saying that happiness is equated with joy? I, I'm not saying that. I'm not saying that. I'm saying that this huge difference that we're drawing between the two, we're not going to see that drawn in the same way in the scriptures. Biblically speaking, we're going to find out that happiness is not the absence of pain, suffering, or even sadness. We're going to see that. Here, here's what I decided to do. I want to throw you a working definition of the word happy. I thought, what? Because if I were you, because I think continually, I'm a classroom person, and I think continually, if I were sitting where you're sitting, what would I want to ask? If I were in a classroom of 25 and the teacher said, any questions, what would I ask? This is what I would hold up my hand and ask. How would you define happiness? All right, I like that. I like that. So I'm going to throw you out what I believe at the end of the day, happiness is for the person in Christ. Happiness is pervasive, persuasive awakeness to Christ's presence and his promises. In other words, we're awakening to the fact that our Christ is alive and with us and that his promises will bear true. And that he has given us the favor of divine grace through the power of the cross. That is pretty fabulous news. But it's that news becoming persuasive to us and pervasive to us. In other words, it is taking root and it's getting in us through and through. Do you know, well, you, you do know this, that studies across the board, I, at least I... They, there may be some that, that um, defy this, but I haven't read them. So I'll say virtually across the board are showing survey after survey that there is a, um, a direct ratio between more screen time, less happiness. More screen time, less happiness. There's a recent article out about teenagers that is so disturbing about how purely unhappy they are getting. I believe it was in the Atlantic. Uh, the title was something to the effect of, are we losing a generation? It's talking about screens and it's talking about how they're being cut off from real life relationships because it's becoming the isolation of a screen. And it feels like it pretends to be real life relationship and real life interaction, but it's getting getting less and less and less happy. This little phrase in James 5.13 says, is anybody happy? James says, let him sing praise. I found a, a really fun quote. Jesus promised his disciples three things, that they would be completely fearless, absurdly happy, and in constant trouble. Does anybody but me like that? I mean, you know what? We have enough pain in the world. We have enough several. I mean, that is one of the, th you talk about a great tattoo. If you really want to have a long one, a really long one, that would make a great one right there. Completely fearless, absurdly happy, and in constant trouble. I, I want to say this to you. Take these last few minutes to make this point. 
Would it change anything? This has been a big one for me. In the course of growing up all these years in church, probably because I was such a failure in so many ways and so flawed. But would it make any difference to you to know that God is not unhappy? Anybody? What, when you and I try to lock down how we see God, do we see him in our minds, God's angry a lot. He's probably in a terrible mood. I mean, look at all of what he has to see. And surely he is so disappointed. Disappointed really doesn't carry much weight because for dis disappointment means you had an expectation that is not met. He already knows everything. So I, he can be unhappy with us, but disappointed. He knew exactly what you were going to do and he knew exactly what I was going to do. And he sent his son to the cross anyway. And he loved us anyway. But I mean, what, what's his disposition like? Would it make any difference? I love this. Randy Alcorn writes this. I love this, quoting word for word. The logic is that since people are full of sin, God must be full of unhappiness. But this logic begins in the wrong place with ourselves. We flatter ourselves. This was so humbling for me to read. We flatter ourselves by imagining we are the primary source of God's happiness, tilting him one way or the other by what we think, say, or do. Is that a revelation to anybody but me? He says, you know what? Actually, when you think that you just make God, that all of us are just making God so unhappy, you flatter yourselves, he says. Because we're assuming that we have the power to dictate his disposition. I don't know about you, but I can't even express the gladness I have in knowing that I am not responsible for God's mood. I, I don't even know what to do with my own mood half the time. If I have to be responsible for God's mood, I don't know what to do with that. I just don't know what to do with it. I want you to turn with me to 1 Timothy. This is going to be uh, the last set of scriptures we'll look at uh, this evening. But I want you to go with me there, if you would, please. 1 Timothy 1.11 and 6.15. 1.11. In accordance with the gospel of the glory of the blessed God with which I have been entrusted. The blessed God. What odd terminology. Paul is calling God the blessed God here. Go and look with me at 1 Timothy 6. 15, which he will display at the proper time, he who is the blessed and only sovereign, the King of kings and Lord of lords, the blessed God. What does it mean that God is called in 1 Timothy 1, 11 and 1 Timothy 6, 15, he is called the blessed God. What on earth does that mean? In um, the Greek that's translated into that blessed, uh, that word, that lexical form of that Greek word is makarios, makarios. It is a beautiful, beautiful word, and it's one you would see translated many, many times uh, in the New Testament scriptures as blessed. And uh, here it is used in reference to God himself. So this won't matter to some people, but it's going to matter a lot to other people. I want you to see, I pulled out five different definitions of the, in five different Greek uh, dictionaries or theology books. I have brought you five of them. I want to show you the definitions of the word makarios that translates blessed and blessed many, many times in the New Testament and right here for blessed God um, in both of those scriptures. Do you see it? Happy, blessed, happy. Do you see that on the third one? That blessed, happy, fortunate. Then the fourth one, blessed, happy. And the fifth one, characterized by happiness and being highly favored as by divine grace. Now, I want you to hear this because this is about to be John Piper talking. And it's going to be marvelous. <laughs> Dr. John Piper writes in his book, The Pleasures of God, Meditating on God's Delight in Being God. Is that the best title you have ever heard? God's Delight in Being God. He writes this. 
There is a beautiful phrase in 1 Timothy 1.11 buried beneath the too familiar surface of Bible buzzwords. Before we dig it up, it sounds like this, the gospel of the glory of the blessed God. But after we dig it up, it sounds like this, the good news of the glory of the happy God. Uh Uh-oh. I mean, that just can't be. He can't be happy. I mean, he can't really be like happy. Or is he? My proposition to you this weekend is that as Christ's people regenerated by his very Holy Spirit, through the power of the cross and resurrection. Is it not also true that we were meant to have a happy default? I said something at the last LPL that God brought back to my remembrance over the last few days. I thought it for years. And I really felt like the Holy Spirit challenged me in my heart. Was, was that accurate? I said, just clear as a bell. We were, I don't even remember what my context was, but I said, you know, I think it was because it was Saturday morning. And, you know, I just sort of, I said, you know, I kind of wake up in a good mood. I said, I've just, thought, I've just had a fairly happy disposition. But the Lord reminded me when I was a child, I did not. No, I didn't. I was uh, full of anxiety. I had um, timidity, tons and tons of fear. I wanted to hide behind my mother's skirt. This was my little childhood. And I thought, like a revelation, it hit me. I mean, it's like a lightning bolt going down through my heart. It hit me. When I look back on the course of my life, the thing that has given me happiness has been Jesus all along. The reason why I can look back and I can think, well, no, I've been pretty happy for a lot of years is because fairly early on I went, if, you, if I don't get eaten alive by you, I'm going to eat my own life alive and I'm going to self-destruct and probably be successful doing it. And I realized all that time that I was thinking, I think I just have a happy personality. No, I don't. No, I don't. No, I don't. Obviously, I don't know if y'all know who Bob Goff is, but he is honestly, honestly, he is one of the happiest people I've ever known in my entire life. And somebody on Twitter here recently compared the two of us, and I thought, no, 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 I'm not Bob. I'm Bob when he's in a bad mood. Because I do, I get worked up about stuff. I'm one of those, I qualify for the third one. I'm in constant trouble, in constant trouble. I get it in every way, in constant trouble. But I'm just asking you, I'm just asking you. If his disposition is joyful and happy, and we have the Holy Spirit in us, is it not possible that even if you have been unhappy for 45 years, that you might have an outbreak of a happy heart? You remember when Jesus, remember when I said earlier um, about John 15, verses 8 through 11, this is when he says to his disciples, it is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit and show yourselves to be my disciples. And he says, as my Father has loved me, so I have loved you, abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I've kept my Father's commandment and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. And he's telling them, you know, as servants of mine, go out there, produce much fruit and do it joyfully. You wanna hear something shocking? Shocking. This is back in Deuteronomy 28, 47, and 48. I'm not applying it to us. I'm only drawing the concept because this is about the children of Israel back in the days of uh, when they were going into the promised land. I want you to listen. Jot that down if you want to look up that address later. Deuteronomy 28, 47 through 48. Listen to this. Listen to the premium God places on joyful servants. 
because you did not serve the Lord your God with joyfulness and gladness of heart, because of the abundance of all things, therefore you shall serve your enemies. So he's saying, if you don't serve me with a good, I mean, a glad and joyful heart, because you did not serve the Lord your God, it's saying, it's being said prophetically in this point, because you did not serve the Lord your God with joyfulness and gladness of heart, because of the abundance of all things, therefore you shall serve your enemies. And see, I, I think there's a, a parallel there because I think when we look around, they thought the other nations were happier than they were. That's ultimately what happened in the promised land. When they had the very one who is the giver of the abundance of joy. This is Matthew 25, 23 out of the NIV. I want you to hear it with me. This is in the parable of the talents when they've been entrusted with God's property and they've taken it and done with it and brought him back interest on it. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. Number three, we are on our way to happily ever after. We could know and we could live our lives like I am on my way to happily ever after. That I can tell you that where I'm going, I'm gonna live happily ever after. And the more I believe it, the more I borrow on that account. Is anybody talking to me this weekend? The more I believe that I am on my way. Do you honestly believe or you, do you just prefer heaven to hell? Or do you really believe that where you have coming, that this life will have been this long, and where you have coming, where I have coming, we will live happily ever after. And there's something about knowing it's coming. There's something about knowing. There's something about knowing. The more we anticipate it, the more we're able to look around us in our, in our struggles and in our heartbreaks and think, this is so short. Oh, this is so short. Because I'm gonna tell you something, blessed, happy is the heart that is on its way in pilgrimage. That's what Psalm 84 says. And I'm on, I'm on a pilgrimage here. I need you to know I'm here for a very, very short time because I'm on my way to happily ever after. That's where I'm going. I'm on my way to happily ever after. That's where I'm heading. And somehow that anticipation, then I know a, a couple of years ago, the team and I were in Orlando and we had a, an event there that weekend. And so, you know, we came in a little bit early because what do you do? I mean, you go to Disney World. But we didn't only have fun riding the rides. We had fun standing in line because we were just talking about, it's going to be so fun. I mean, I'm just like looking at my good buddy Travis and going, my hair is going to get wet on the log ride. It's going to be so fun, I think, I think. But honestly, we were all about the anticipation because there's something about knowing it's going to be fun. It's going to be fun. Did you know you can now give through our app to support the show? Thanks for watching Living Proof with Beth Moore. We hope this message encourages you to love and live God's Word. Click subscribe so you won't miss any teaching. Thanks so much for watching.